every generation we get some kind of groundbreaking things in the Pokemon franchise that kind of changes the game like this becomes the new norm whether it's double battles in gen 3 that now becomes a part of the VGC circuit for these games or it's introducing gimmicks that Pokemon can take on in gen 6 although those vary region to region or even regional variation. Every generation has these, and today we're talking about Scarlet and Violets. Welcome back to the Lumios Post, where we talk about all things Pokemon, and today, you know what we're talking about, the groundbreaking changes that Pokemon Scarlet and Violet introduced into the franchise. So, uh, these games, honestly, were monumental, you know, I know that they had their uh, graphical issues, um, to put it lightly, but these do have a lot of things that I think shows a really positive future for the Pokemon franchise. So first off, we have the DLC. Uh, now, DLC is nothing new to the franchise. That was actually introduced in Generation 8, but Generation 9 continued this trend and changed it up a little bit. Whereas with Generation 8, we saw the Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra, which were two sections of the Galar region that we got to unlock. We took a completely different approach in Scarlet and Violet. The first DLC, the Teal Mask, was set in Kitakami, which is a land that exists outside of Paldea. Now, this this one's really groundbreaking because, for one, you have the fact that Kitakami's not in Paldea, you know? So now, there's the idea that we could have DLCs going forward that don't necessarily have to take place within the region of that game. I remember when people were talking about DLC and speculating on it, everybody seemed to like think, oh, it'll be set in the Canary Islands or the Azores Islands, you know, it's somewhere tied to Spain or Portugal, but then Pokemon went, nope, we're going to Japan with Kitakami. Now, what's also interesting about this is Kitakami is not a place we've seen before. Kitakami is in another region. We don't know what region because it says the land of Kitakami. At no point do they call Kitakami a region. So I'm actually led to believe that Kitakami is a section of a larger region, very similar to how you have uh, the Sevai Islands are a section, a part of the Kanto region, right? Or the fight area in Sinnoh is a part of the Sinnoh region. So we don't know what region Kitakami is a part of, but this does set the ground that, hey, not only could we go outside of the region that this game is set in, but we could even go to a region that we've never even seen before or a piece of a region that we have never even seen before. And then there's the question of could Kitakami pop up in a future Pokemon game? Like could we one day get an expansion of the land of Kitakami? Like where we see the entire region that Kitakami exists in. You know, maybe this is even the Gen 10 region and Kitakami is just a small part of it. The concepts are definitely there and they're crazy cool ideas. I'm I'm really excited to see what they do with this because I do think they'll do more with this as time goes on. It was a hit with fans. I think I think the uh, reaction to Kitakami was largely positive. Now then we have the DLC, the Indigo Disc, and this actually took place in the Blueberry Academy, which exists in the Unova region. So we take this idea that we can leave the Paldea region, we can leave whatever the region the game is set in, and go to another region, and also say that we could go to a past region as well. Not just a new region, but a past region. And yeah, it's just a segment. We don't get to see all of Unova, but that still gives ideas of what we could see in future Pokemon games. So, you know, there's there's the fact that, for one, we could get new areas like this. Blueberry Academy is an area of Unova that we have never been to before. But also, hypothetically, since we're in Unova, you know, w one day we could get DLC that allows us to see an already existing section of another region. Maybe, like I had mentioned before, we go to only the Sevai Islands of the Kanto region. Or we go to only the fight area of the Sinnoh region. Or even just, we only go to Mele Mele Island in Alola. We don't get to visit Pony, Ula Ula, or Kala. We just visit Mele Mele Island. You know, the, the ideas, again, they're endless, and uh, they're, they're really exciting. I think that this is a really cool concept. And again, then there's the fact that the Blueberry Academy is an expansion on Unova, so we could get expansions on Kanto, expansions on Sinnoh, expansions on... It, it, ah, man, it... I, I cannot. Like, this is, this is too cool. 
And speaking of DLC, we actually also have something that was introduced in the Teal Mask, Blood Moon Ursa Luna. Now, forms of older Pokemon are not really anything new. You know, you have regional variations that exist. Uh, that was something we mentioned earlier. Mega Evolutions. Uh, these are things that have been in the franchise for a while. But Blood Moon Ursa Luna is different because Mega Evolution is something I can do with any Lucario, right? Uh, a regional form, any Vulpix in the Alola region is an Alolan Vulpix. It will become an Alolan Vulpix, right? Uh, or any Pikachu that evolves in the Alolan region will become an Alolan Raichu. It will become that form of Raichu. But this Ursaluna is different because not all Ursaluna become this. In fact, this was a freak thing that happened to this one Ursaluna. So it's more like a cryptid, very similar to like the uh, real world Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot or the Yeti. That's kind of what Blood Moon Ursaluna is. And it, it paves the way for us to get these weird one-off forms like this you know uh, i've mentioned before legend za could do something crazy like have a poison type sharpedo that's living in the uh, lumio sewers and it's not a collosium form of sharpedo it's just some freak thing that happened to this one sharpedo because it got lost in lumiosis sewers and so on and so on there's so many ideas they can do with this and i love that idea like at any point we could just get this crazy form where one Pokemon just went through this really weird change, but it's not a variation. It, it almost makes that Pokemon feel legendary, right? Again, it gives them like this cryptid status, like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. I think that is so freaking cool. Number three, we have Convergent Pokemon. In Scarlet and Violet, we got introduced to three new lines. That was the Toad's Cool line, the Wiglet line, and uh, with DLC, the Poltergeist line. And these were a little bit weird because they, you can see that they look very similar to other Pokemon. Wiglet looks very similar to Diglett. Toad's Cool looks very similar to uh, Tentacruel or Tentacool. And then also you have Poltergeist and Sinistra look very similar to Poltegeist and Sinistri, you know? So what does this mean? Like, cause this is groundbreaking. Uh, for one, it, it's convergent evolution, you know, in our real world that is a real thing that happens where basically two unrelated animals because of the environmental situations that they're in end up just naturally evolving to have very similar features and this is a very pokemonized take on that obviously like it's not this is not really what convergent evolution looks like in our world it's a very pokemonized version of it but uh, the explanation here is that obviously these Pokemon couldn't be regional forms. With past regional forms, things like Vulpix, it makes sense that we could see a fox become an Arctic fox, just another kind of fox. A tree, Executor, becomes a taller tree based on the climate. That totally makes sense. But how are you going to explain a mole becoming an eel or a jellyfish becoming a mushroom? That makes no sense. So obviously you have to say, well, these are two entirely different Pokemon. They just happen to look really similar. Now, this is something that since Game Freak added another Poltergeist with the DLC, I think it's something we could see going forward. Like, I, I think this is something that Game Freak's going to want to do now. I mean, we even have some evidence in the data that there might have been a planned Magikarp and Gyarados scrapped Convergent Pokemon. So yeah, that's already like a, a beta design. They've gotten their vault somewhere probably. So, yeah, I mean, what is next for these? You know, what could we see next in Legend ZA or in Gen 10 and so on? There, there's even an argument to be made that this could be something that does actually take the place of regional variation. I would not like that, but that's a topic for another time, one that I've actually touched on before, uh, so you can check that out. Next, we have Tauros. Tauros is nothing new. It came in in Gen 1, but it got a regional variant in Gen 9. And now that is also not new. Regional variations have existed since uh, Gen 7 now. But something that Paldean Tauros gets that's so special is the breeds. The Combat Breed, the Aqua Breed, and the Blaze Breed of Tauros. Now what's interesting about this is that these all are, you know, one Pokemon. It's just alternate forms of them, and them being called breeds suggests that they were bred in different ways to give us this blaze breed, to give us this aqua breed, to give us this combat breed. And that's something that I could see Pokemon playing around with in the future. And not just with regional forms, you know, like it doesn't have to be that in Gen 10, there's a regional Hound Hour. It could just be that in Gen 10, we breed Hound Hour a little bit differently. So we have this blaze breed and this aqua breed of Hound Hour. So one's dark fire and one's dark water and then this is something too that could be used to kind of replace regional variation as it's a bit more sustainable because then going forward you can still just have the 
Blaze and Aqua breed of Hound Hour, and it doesn't have to be diversified by region, but just by the way you breed Hound Hour. We've seen kind of a similar thing already, if you think about it, where like if I breed a Snorlax, it will hatch into a Snorlax. But if I breed a Snorlax while holding a certain item, it will hatch into a Munchlax. So this is kind of a similar concept. And this could even be a setup for some kind of uh, gimmick or some kind of feature in a future Pokemon game like Gen 10, where we see us being able to kind of customize our Pokemon in the way we breed them. And, and I mean beyond natures and IVs and EVs and abilities and movesets, but like even just there's a bulkier breed of Dragonite. And so if you breed Dragonite a certain way, it's just going to, its base stats are going to be diversified a little bit. It's something like that. Or maybe it has a more uh, defensive typing or defensive ability. I think that could be a concept that uh, I think could do really, really well. And I think people would like that because like you're getting to kind of customize your Pokemon based on how you're breeding it, which just makes you feel special because it makes you feel like you're having a little more input into your Pokemon. They're a little more personalized to you. It's the same reason people want like Pokemon customization, like getting to put clothes on them so you can personalize your Pokemon a little bit more. Lastly, we have the Paradox Pokemon. So the Paradox Pokemon are obviously something very groundbreaking. For one, it's a brand new classification of Pokemon, but for two, it kind of points to a larger thing going on with Pokemon here. So, you know, this this is pointing to a, a multiverse and, and all that because we know that these Pokemon come from alternate timelines. So they're, they're all from different universes. They're not from our own. And now this isn't really new to Pokemon, right? Like we've seen multiverse stuff uh, going as far back as like over 10 years ago. And then, you know, getting played around with a lot more, especially in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon with like the Ultra Ruins and Team Rainbow Rocket. But this just kind of shows that Pokemon is not really worried about multiverse fatigue. You know, right now there is a big multiverse high in a lot of media, you know, whether you're Marvel, whether you're DC, whether you're uh, an Oscar winning movie, uh, various cartoons have touched on this, including the Pokemon anime. And you could even kind of argue that Star Wars has touched on this a little bit. Pretty much everyone and their cousin is playing around with the multiverse right now. And so Pokemon's cashing in on this. Now there is an argument to be made that there's some fatigue around multiverse stories, you know, that that's kind of often used as a cheap excuse. Oh, we killed off this character, but we're just replacing it with this character who's the same character just from a different universe. Yeah, it, it can get pretty lame, but this shows that Pokemon is willing to lean more into this and uh, they're doing this by showing us these Paradox Pokemon, which are direct results of their alternate timelines. The only time we've seen a result of an alternate timeline is with Rainbow Rocket and the Ultra Ruins, but this just shows Pokemon's leaning more into it and giving us essentially multiversal variants of other Pokemon, because that's what Walking Wake is, right? Like a multiversal variant of Suicune, and that's just so freaking sick to me. Uh, also, it does make sense that Gen 10 is up on the horizon. It's a, it's probably going to be a celebratory gen because not only is it the 10th generation of Pokemon, but it also will likely be releasing on the 30th anniversary. I think that's the, uh, the big mindset right now in the community is that Gen 10 will release on the 30th anniversary. And so it's going to be a celebratory gen. Look at how Sun and Moon was where they were shoving like all the stuff from back in the day at you. Oh, look, Red's back and he's aged up. Blue is too. Here's Grimsley. He's randomly here. We don't know why. Chorus is also here. You know, just throwing things right at your face. They want to celebrate the entirety of the franchise. And I feel like the multiverse is an easy way they do that. You know, it's the same way everybody's looking to like Avengers Secret Wars because they're hoping that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man will come back and Nicolas Cage's Ghost Rider will come back. All that kind of stuff. And this is Pokemon's chance to do that. And again, what better time than now? And this will allow us to really play with the multiverse in Pokemon, which could be a fun way to tickle our nostalgia bone as well as also provide some really cool stuff. Like instead of something as lame as what if Giovanni won? What if we got, what if Red was evil? What if the original dragon never split? Or even just getting to see the world where Giovanni won. You know, I, screw just seeing Giovanni with his Mewtwo. I want to see what that universe looks like now. You know, and especially with Cyrus, because that means he recreated the universe. What does Cyrus's universe look like? Lysander's world. You know, it, to see those kinds of things would be pretty wild. And I think 
I think the Paradox Pokemon show that that's something that the Pokemon company could very well be interested in doing. So yeah, those are five things that I think are really groundbreaking from Scarlet and Violet. There's definitely some other things that you could argue, you know, open world, uh, it, that's just an obvious one. Uh, even the Terrastal gimmick, you could argue it in itself is groundbreaking. But I wanted to pick my top five. Let me know some things that you thought were really groundbreaking in Scarlet and Violet below. And uh, you positive about the future of Pokemon? Because I definitely am. Be sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss all of our future videos. And until next time, I'll see all of you later.